my day job is at Northbrook Grumman. I retired from Raytheon at the end of May. Uh, I've been the chair of this section, what, at three or four different times, depending how you want to count. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, Ken has asked me to advise you to not put any garbage in the garbage cans. Uh, put them in the garbage bags that are put back. Um, that'll make it easier for us to uh, uh, depart. Um, we don't have to pay as much for renting this uh, facility. Uh, secondly, you should know that this is being recorded. This event is being recorded. And uh, we'll be available uh, for uh, viewing again uh, at a later time. And Kim's very good about uh, putting everything online. And so you'll be able to uh, uh, revisit this event again uh, in the very near future. Restrooms are off to my right. Uh, just go down that corridor that has exit over it, you'll, you'll see them in pretty obvious. Well, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker, Bob Zubrin. Uh, Bob is no stranger to this section. In fact, I think I introduced you the last time you came over uh, to LA uh, to talk about Mars. So it's fair to say Bob is best known really in our community for his visionary uh, approach for really uh, accelerating Mars exploration. Uh, and, and he's written many books on that topic. And he's written a book on the topic he's going to talk about this evening, uh, which is the case for nuclear power, which I think is very timely. Uh, I think um, I'll just express my personal opinion here on, on uh, my concern about climate change and how that's really being accelerated uh, by the use of uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, and, and so there are different ways to mitigate that, and certainly nuclear power is one of them. Uh, Bob has a long history in our industry. He uh, really was, uh, I don't know if you started your career at Lockheed Martin, but I know you were there for, for quite a while. Did you ever work at TRW? No. I didn't think so. I wasn't sure. I, thought but I was at Martin Marietta before. Yes, I was at Mark Marietta too in the 1980s, uh, but I worked on the East Coast, so, but I did come out to Denver quite a bit. So. Uh, uh, and Bob is one of the founders, I think the founder really of the Mars Society, and uh, that is generating a lot of interest and has done so for decades. So sit back and uh, join me in welcoming Bob Zuber. Now, um, 
any case, uh, but it, 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 it looks like it's a very promising thing if anyone has an interest. Um, and if you can't come, it, it, it will be viewable online. Uh, the Mars Society website, uh, marssociety.org, has the instructions on how to watch the conference call. Um, so my topic for tonight, though, is the case for nukes, how to beat global warming and create a free, open, and magnificent future. So nukes, global warming, and a magnificent future uh, is a lot to talk about in an hour, but uh, and I won't be able to cover it all adequately, but fortunately I have written a book on the subject, and we've got them right there, and if after the talk you think this is worth finding out more about, you buy them, I'll sign them, it's 20 bucks, and you know, pretty soon you're only gonna be able to buy a stick of chewing gum for 20 bucks, but you can still buy a case of nukes. Um, Buy it before your money becomes worthless. Um, okay, so, all right. Uh, I have a heretical thesis, okay, and here it is. Um, I mean, what's gonna happen in terms of most people will agree with half of my points, okay? That is because this issue has become so politicized and people are divided into tribes in terms of discussing it, and you either believe the one catechism or the opposite catechism. Um, but um, I have three from column A and three from column B. Um, so, okay, first of all, global warming and anthropogenic uh, chem uh, atmosphere chemistry change are both real. Now, okay, they are not currently a crisis. Uh, but they could become one. Uh, now, the problem here is that the primary solution offered by those who recognize this problem, which is to say to increase the cost of fuel and electricity, okay, thereby making them less affordable to people of limited means, is unethical and impractical, and it deserves to fail, and has failed, and will continue to fail spectacularly. Okay, because people actually don't want to be poor. Okay. Um, the claim that modern civilization can be powered by updated forms of pre-industrial power sources, namely biomass and wind and sunshine, uh, is nonsensical. These things were already becoming inadequate in the early 1800s, um, and you can't power the, a civilization that is like 300 times more energy intensive today with these same sources. Um, the more radical prescription of global population reduction to meet this um, problem is uh, worse uh, than the previous one. Uh, that is, um, you may know that a few years ago, Michael Moore put out a movie, Michael Moore, of course, is the person who left, and he pleased conservatives by debunking all the green energy stuff uh, that was being promoted by the moderate left. And uh, so the conservatives said, that's great, he's showing that wind power is debunk. Uh, but then he comes out for population reduction. Um, it's a far more radical solution. And if, if, if that were attempted, um, well, put it this way, um, if you actually convince people that global population reduction in a serious way is necessary, there are men of action who have ideas on how to do that. Um, and you're not gonna like what happens next. Um, the, um, that far from, and this is the most important point here, it's in red for this reason, far from contracting our energy use, human progress must and will inevitably entail continued exponential growth of human power generation, okay? And that therefore the widespread adoption of nuclear energy is essential for a positive human future, okay? So, let me explain. Okay, so first of all, this here is, um, in, in certain ways, this is the greatest story ever told. Um, you're looking at an incredible rise in human living standards. Uh, here's 1875, 
the year is 1800 when Malthus wrote. Um, I'm not sure I am. Okay. Uh, when the average per capita income in the world was, wait for it, uh, $200 a year in today's money, not in that kind of money, but in today's money. Okay. And now it is $12,000 a year. Well, that doesn't sound like that much, does it? Um, but <laughs> it's a lot more. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, 50 times um, what it was. Okay, so here you're looking at the world described in the novels of Victor Hugo and uh, Charles Dickens, where you have people who are actually starving to death in London and Paris, okay, the most advanced cities in the world. Okay, now we're at $12,000. Okay, it's grown 50 times. Now the world population has grown seven times at the same time. So the GDP of the world has grown seven times 50 or 350 times. Okay. So, you know, Malthus who lived there said continued population growth will drive the standard living down. The theory could not be more counterfactual. Okay. That is, not only did product rise with population, it rose in proportion to population cubed. Okay. Um, that's how uh, forcefully it rose. Uh, now, 12,000 a year. The average income in the United States today, and the pretty average per capita GDP, which is the average income, is $60,000. Okay. So the, this is the global average, 12,000. This is like Mexico or Brazil, okay? They're about the average of the world, okay? Uh, half the world is below average, okay? Africa, okay? Much worse conditions than Latin America, okay? The, 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 but think about this, 60,000 a year in the USA, we still have some poverty here, okay? Much worse in the average country and vastly worse in the below average country, because half the world is below average. That's what it means to be average. Uh, have half the world below you. Um, so if we wanted to, in the 21st century, and I think this is a good goal for the 21st century, to bring the average of the world up to the current American average, you'd have to raise worldwide energy consumption five times. So it, it's not a question of, well, we'll try to replace a little bit of coal with a little bit of wind or this. We've got to increase the total amount of power five times, and that does not even account for population growth. Okay. Um, so again, uh, this is a more proof that Malthusianism is false. Uh, here is GDP per capita graph against population. Okay, so as you can see, uh, Thank you. Uh, is that contrary to Malthus, as the population has gone up, the standard of living has gone up. Now, how can that be? Because on the surface, it, you can see Malthus makes a certain amount of sense. You say, well, if there's more people, there's going to be less to go around, right? Well, but it's not so. Because human resources are depend on technology. Uh, and technology is created by inventors. And the more inventors, the more inventions. And inventions are cumulative, okay? And so actually resources have been expanding. And uh, here's an interesting one for you. Uh, some of the people here who are of my generation may remember this. Some of you who are younger may not have heard of this. But around 1968, right here, there was um, a, a bestseller written called The Population Bomb, written by a guy called Paul Burrow. This was one of the way they saw it. And he said, okay, here we are. The world has got, uh, well, it's actually three and a half billion people. It's about right there. Uh, and he projected that by the year 2000, the population would double. Okay, well, if we have this much food now, and we're gonna have twice as many people, the standard of living is gonna go like this. Instead, it actually went like this. The population did go double. Okay? 
okay, he, that, that part was right. But what happened as a result of that was exactly the opposite. Now you could say, okay, a lot of people can be wrong about the future, right? I mean, everybody's wrong about the future, right? But think about this. Paul Ehrlich, the author of that book, was born in 1931, here. Now, so he was around in 1931. Now, if his theory was correct, that the, the, the more people, the lower the standard of living, therefore the fewer people, the higher standard of living, the world would have been up here in 1931. And he would have been there to see it, the great golden age of the 1930s, okay? Okay, except it was here. So he was not just wrong about the future, he was wrong about the past. The, um, which, that one, I don't get a pass for. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's a nonsensical thing, <coughs> okay, in terms of the facts. Now, <clears throat> once again, you say, okay, it's technology that creates um, living standards. And in fact, if, if you say L is the living standard, as in the GDP per capita, P is population, G is the gross domestic product, and T is technology. Well then, okay, living standard is the gross product divided by the population. Okay, the gross product is the population times technology. And, and that, by the way, is how I'm defining technology, that which multiplies the productivity of people, okay? And if you put these equations together, you just get living standard equals technology. That's what works out to it. Now, how is the technology created? Well, it's created by human effort, okay? Which we typically measure in person hours or person years, okay? And so if we look at the, sort of the labor of the entire human race in terms of global person years, okay? Starting in the year zero AD, okay? The time of the Emperor Augustus. Here is the GDP per person, is a little more than $100 a year, okay? So, it actually does go up a little bit by 1500. There's a little bit of increase. I mean, it's not true that there is no technological progress. Things are being developed, uh, water wheels, windmills, better sailing ships. Um, and then in 1500, now we see a significant change in the trajectory. Now it definitely starts just going up, okay? From 1500, and then there's another inflection point at 1800 when it really starts to shoot up. Now, what are the reasons for these two inflection points? What happens in the year 1500? In 1500, long distance sailing ships are introduced that are capable of sailing around the world, okay? They can sail from Europe to China and back, okay? So, before 1500, there really isn't a global economy. There's a Chinese economy, there's a European economy, there's an Islamic world economy, there's an economy in the Aztec world, in the uh, Mexico, and another one in, in, in Peru. These things are not linked, okay? And innovations made in one of these um, economies can take centuries to reach one of the others. For instance, it takes uh, thousands of years for horses domesticating in Europe to reach the New World. It takes about 500 years for printing developed in China to reach Europe, okay? Um, so, but once you have sailing ships of this character, then innovations in one part of the world can reach every other part of the world within a year or two, okay? The, and so once, so in other words, inventions made anywhere now become useful not just within their regional economy, but everywhere. So now, for instance, Europe starts to advance very rapidly based on the acquisition of inventions made all over the world. Okay, some made in Europe, but sure, lots made in China, lots made in uh, the Americas, the, the uh, so forth. Um, so things start moving much faster. And then, of course, in 1800, this is amplified by the introduction of high energy power sources, steam engines, uh, and also ever more rapid communications, steamboats, railroads, telegraphs, and so forth. 
And now things that happen in one part of the world can become known all over the world the next day. Okay. Um, you know, by the late 1800s, you're essentially in the modern world where if something happens in Europe, uh, you know, today, it, 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 it's known here the next day. Um, or even in a few cases, ours. Um, the, um, so that's what happens now. So what you effectively have is a much larger population doing inventing. Okay. Um, now, but still, with a larger population, why don't we run out of resources? Okay. And the answer is, it's people who create resources. And here's the proof. Okay. I mean, in general, I mean, land is not a resource till people invent agriculture, and it becomes a bigger resource as agriculture is improved in its efficiency. Okay. Um, but you take metals, which, aside from land, is the major resource that historically, until you get to the world of oil, that, that countries were worth uh, going to war for. Okay. Willing to go to war for, not war for. Okay, well, think about this. People start using metals starting with copper around 6,000 BC. And uh, a number of other metals are introduced, silver, gold, tin, lead. Uh, this is the Bronze Age. And these are all metals that can be smelted at relatively low temperatures, accessible with pottery cans. Okay. Collectively, they add up to less than 100 parts per million of the Earth's but around 11, uh, 1200 BC, somebody in, in the Hittite Empire introduces high temperature kilns, and they can now smelt iron. And iron is present not 100 parts per million, but 50,000 parts per million. Okay, so we're, we're talking about almost a three order of magnitude increase in the availability of metals through this technological innovation. And this completely changes the world. Before this, metals are only something for aristocrats. They can be used in artwork, or they can be used for the armor of the kings and nobles. Like if you read Homer, all the action is about the heroes, the, the, the mob, the soldiers don't count for anything. They don't have metal weapons okay, or metal armor. But as soon as you have iron, now, okay, Yes, you have metal weapons, but you also now have metal tools that are cheap enough for peasants to use. The iron tip plows, iron axes, uh, things like this. Uh, and now they can cut down trees and plow soil that was actually too rich to be plowed uh, before. Um, and you get a massive expansion of agriculture uh, and of human population as a result. And then, if we go further in time uh, to the uh, 1800s, it's in the late 1800s that aluminum is introduced. Okay, you go into any real antique store, you won't find anything in aluminum in it. Nothing. Aluminum was unknown to science until 1820. Okay, um, and uh, it doesn't become something in, in common use until about 1890 or so. Uh, and then much more so in the 20th century. Uh, because you can't smelt aluminum with thermal furnaces, you have to use electricity. No electricity, no aluminum. So there you have it. And then the other things, titanium and silicon, well these are, don't become a thing until the mid 20th century. Um, and of course now they have all sorts of roles in, in, in the technology, undreamed of. Um, <clears throat> So, the, you know, if Napoleon Bonaparte had called together his general staff and they're thinking about invading a country and he's asking them to lift, list the natural resources, they might have, well, they would have listed the iron ore and they would have listed the land. But they wouldn't have listed the aluminum ore and they wouldn't even have listed oil. Oil didn't become a resource until people developed oil drilling and refining and machines that could run on the product. Okay, oil doesn't become a resource until the 1860s. Before that, it was a nuisance. That first of all, mostly people didn't even know it was there, but when it happened, 
ooze to the surface, it would ruin your farm. Um, the stinky stuff coming out of the ground ruining your farm. Um, the, 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 you know, so, and of course, uranium, obviously not a resource for Napoleon's general staff, um, or even for the German general staff in 1914. Um, no, it's, it's uranium, it needs it to paint plates red. Um, you know, who cares, right? Um, and deuterium is not a resource now, but it will be once we develop fusion power. So it's people who create resources. This concept that the Earth has so much carrying capacity and it's carrying us and we're becoming a burden to the Earth is pure nonsense. The Earth isn't carrying us, we are carrying us. All right, so, nuclear energy. All right, the root of nuclear energy, okay, of course, the very famous equation, E equals mc squared, setting a relationship between mass and energy. And it's an awful lot of energy per unit of mass. Okay. Um, well, in around 1920, um, the um, British scientists uh, made very precise measurements of the weight of atomic nucleon and compared that to the total number of nucleons in the uh, nucleus. And what you see is that the, um, the, 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 the binding energy per nucleon increases at iron and is less with hydrogen and less with uranium. So it's the middle weight elements have the most binding energy per nucleus, and the um, uh, um, this curve is really upside down, because what you really are looking at here is an energy pit, which is lowest at iron, and higher with uranium or hydrogen, okay? And if you're moving from here to here, you're falling down in potential energy, or here. And Looking at these results, Sir Arthur Eddington, who is the guy who actually empirically proved the theory of relativity by making an observation of a, uh, Venus during a transit, uh, an eclipse in 1919, he realized that this had to be the source of energy for the stars. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm leaving something out. In the late 1800s, there was a real mystery in science which is what powers the sun. Um, or, because you see, the geologists looking at erosion processes and the biologists who had started to pick up on the theory of evolution had come to the conclusion the Earth has to be at least 100 million years old. The physicists said that's impossible because if the sun was made of pure coal, we know how massive it is, we know how much energy it's putting out, the, the most it could possibly last be a couple of million years. So you, your theories that the age of the Earth is 100 million years old have got to be false, okay? Now, in fact, it's a big underestimate the Earth was 4 billion years old, okay? Um, but since all the physicists knew about was chemical energy, they could not possibly account for the sun being more than 2 million years old. And here, this gave the show away. There was a much larger source of energy available in going from hydrogen to helium. And uh, so Arthur Eddington said, if indeed the subatomic energy in the stars is being freely used to maintain their great furnaces, it seems to bring a little nearer to fulfillment our dream of controlling the latent power of the well for the well-being of the human race or its suicide. In other words, he realized there was an enormous potential energy source here. Okay. And indeed it is. And the, the, if you uh, there are people who view the Earth's energy resources as the common heritage of mankind. This is sort of a socialist idea, and it's a debatable proposition, but it's useful in one sense, in that uh, you may not own it, but the amount of energy that there is in the world, regardless of who owns it, is of concern to you, because if it's not there, you can't buy it, okay? Uh, you might not own it right now, but 
it's really a good thing that somebody else does so you can buy it. Um, and well, so what is your share of the world's known conventional fossil fuels? If this money, if this was turned into cash, what, how much would you get? Well, it's $114,000. Okay, now that's for you and all of your descendants, so don't think that's a lot of money. Um, you know, I can give it up to all future generations. Um, okay, estimate the unknown conventional fossil fuels, not about twice that. Uh, nuclear fission, uranium ore with no reprocessing, not that much of an efficient. Nuclear fission with reprocessing, a big, uh, much larger than these numbers. Nuclear fission, including thorium, $30 million compared to 100000 that, now, now I'm dropping some money. Uh, now, uh, natural gas, including subsea methane hydrates, which is a futuristic fuel source for me, a uh, million dollars. Nuclear fission with the uranium from seawater, uh, no reprocessing, another couple of million dollars. But with reprocessing, $260 million, okay. Thorium, a billion dollars, okay. So you are thorium billionaires. And nuclear fusion, well, it's just like quadrillions or something. Um, so this is what you're giving up if you abandon nuclear power. You're losing your billion dollars worth of nuclear power. Um, um, now, just to give you an idea, here, here's another thing. You take a kilogram of granite rock, like many buildings are built, made of, or mountains are made of. Um, it contains two parts per million uranium and eight parts per million thorium. Okay, uh, but these things are each uh, uh, 10 million times as much energy per unit weight as coal. And what that means is that, or oil, um, one kilogram of <coughs> granite rock has the same energy as 100 kilograms of oil. Wow. Okay. So you are literally surrounded by mountains of energy. Okay. You know, in the Bible, there's a, a, a story about Moses hitting a rock with his staff and water comes out of the rock, right? Okay. Well, there's energy in the rock. Okay. If we hit it with the right staff, there's a huge amount of energy in the rock. Okay. A uh, hundred kilograms of oil for every kilogram of rock. Um, the, 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 so we're, we're surrounded by mountains of these things, just like those ancient people who were using very rare copper and tin were all the time surrounded by mountains of iron and aluminum, okay, for that matter. Um, so we're surrounded by mountains of energy. Now, <clears throat> the story, the book does discuss uh, at some length the history of the birth of nuclear energy which is a very interesting story. Um, the uh, nuclear fission is discovered by uh, Lisa Meitner. Okay, she was uh, an Austrian of Jewish heritage. Um, she was not Jewish, she was a Christian actually, but she was of Jewish descent, and as far as Hitler was concerned, that's enough to be killed. So she left Germany and went to Sweden uh, to escape the Nazis. Now, uh, and then her prior collaborator, Otto Hahn, did an experiment in Berlin in 1938 in which he got these very odd results um, of you know, starting with uranium, getting uh, barium and some other stuff, and uh, he couldn't explain it. Uh, she looked at it, and decided that this actually had to be nuclear fission. And she went to a Christmas party where her nephew, who was working for Niels Bohr, came. And she told him about it, and he went back to Denmark, and he told Niels Bohr about it, 
and Niels Bohr then went across the ocean to New York to a physics conference in January 1939 and told the people there, including Indigo Fermi, okay? Fermi was Italian, his wife was Jewish, and so he had to leave fascist Italy. He was in New York, at Columbia, as you know. Um, and uh, they very quickly duplicated the experiment, uh, and then um, they got uh, Albert Einstein to sign a letter to Franklin Roosevelt saying, somebody can make a bomb out of this. And it was hand delivered to Roosevelt by an influential New York financier who was able to get into Roosevelt's presence and have a letter in his hands from the most famous scientist in the world. They got his attention. And um, FDR said to Albert Sachs, so Albert, what you're saying is you don't want Hitler to blow us up. Thus was born the Manhattan Project, okay? Um, and um, the, uh, there was a, a scientist named Samuel Allison. Um, Samuel Allison was actually the PhD advisor of Fred Reedy, who was my PhD advisor. So I'm actually his academic grandson. And he was at the University of Chicago and uh, he didn't like organized sports. I share that prejudice with him. And so he recommended that they put the first nuclear reactor under the football stand stadiums at the okay. University of Chicago. That's why I went to the University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there it is. And um, they built the uh, first atomic pile there and pulled the rods and lo and behold, they had a self-sustaining chain reaction. And uh, Arthur Compton, who was actually um, Allison's PhD advisor, but also an advisor to uh, Roosevelt, you know, uh, te te uh, telegraphed the news back to Washington, the Italian navigator has landed in the New World, and the natives are friendly. So they started the Manhattan Project, uh, and uh, today, the bombing of Hiroshima is controversial. It was not at the time. Okay. It absolutely was not at the time. Uh, and uh, what you're looking at here is the scene in Jackson Square, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, when the news came that the Japs had surrendered, the Japanese had surrendered. Um, and they're over the top. And that was because they Japanese had surrendered because they realized that all this work they had been doing had been key in, in making it happen. Um, and there's the reunion of the uh, Manhattan Project scientists in 1946. Uh, and then here is the gentleman who, well, not the gentleman, but uh, the person um, who um, then turned it into nuclear power. And that is, of course, uh, Hyman Rickle. Um, the, um, and, uh, uh, who, uh, realized the potential of nuclear energy for powering the submarines. Um, the World War II submarines were not true submarines. They can only stay underwater about 24 hours. They'd have to come to the surface and run their diesel engines, charge up their batteries. They could cruise for a long time on the surface with these engines, but if they wanted to go underwater, it had to be on batteries. They could about 24 hours uh, underwater. Uh, Rick Over uh, realized that here was a source of power that didn't require oxygen, uh, so it could enable a submarine. And uh, well, Rick Over had an extremely forceful personality, um, which made him unpopular in many places. I mean, he was not known for his tact, but he was a real bulldozer, and he had to be because. Once the oil interests got wind of this project, they actually tried to shut it down. Um, and, um, and they had friends in the Navy uh, and in the government and so forth. Um, and um, the <clears throat> Truman was president until early 1953 when Eisenhower came in. 
So there's a change in administrations in early 1953. And the Rickover was a FDR Truman Democrat. And there were people in Eisenhower's entourage who were allied with um, Joe McCarthy, uh, who was using the accusation of uh, communism to go after FDR Truman Democrats. Rickover was certainly not a communist, but he was a member of a political faction that was on the hit list. Um, and they were moving to shut the program down, uh, and he uh, had to demonstrate that it worked, so he uh, started the reactor up in Idaho, and they laid out charts, and he said, we are now gonna go from New York to Ireland underwater. We are not stopping. Uh, they turned the reactor on full bore, it's a simulated cruise, uh, underwater across the Atlantic, and all sorts of things are going wrong as they're doing it. He was like, you gotta stop the test. Uh, and, and they made it. And um, it's quite the episode. And um, anyway, the Nautilus was then taken out. That's the first nuclear submarine in sea trials. It sank practically the whole US Navy uh, because nobody could do anything about it. Um, and they immediately ordered several more nuclear submarines. Um, now, so while this is going on, the Soviets had uh, developed uh, first atomic bombs following us, but then they developed the hydrogen bomb before us. Um, and uh, Eisenhower administration wanted to have a response to this, so they launched what they called Atoms for Peace program, American Atoms for Peace, which is the counter to Soviet Atoms for War, with a tremendous speech that Eisenhower gave in the United Nations in um, 1953. Um, the um, United States pledges before you and therefore before the world its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to finding the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but to consecrate to his life. Adam's place. And in order to make this real, they had to create a civilian nuclear reactor. And the place to go was Rickover. Um, and <clears throat> they took the Rickover submarine reactor <clears throat> and they put it on land and they put a containment building around it and you had the shipping port nuclear power plant 1957. Now, one interesting thing, both the nuclear reactor and the Nautilus, it took three years from contract signing to operation. Shipping port, three years, okay, to build that nuclear power plant and put it in operation. Now it takes 16. We'll come back to that later. But um, it only took three. Now, there's a very important thing about Okay, about 90% of nuclear reactors in the world are based on the Rickover design today. Okay, and it's known as the pressurized water reactor. And the genius of it is that, see what Fermi had discovered was that um, this vision that people had of nuclear fission as being Nuclear uh, neutrons hitting nuclei like cannonballs and back, back breaking them apart uh, was false. <clears throat> okay, that it was more like the on the nuclear scale, the neutrons are just kind of moseying along and they get pulled into the nucleus through uh, nuclear forces, and the nucleus then becomes unstable because it's too big and it breaks apart. And it breaks apart in a way in which extra neutrons are released to continue the reaction. Okay, but because the way this is the way it works, the slower the neutron is going, the more chance it has of creating a fission. So to sustain a nuclear reaction, um, you want, especially if you have low enriched fuel, that is the Natural uranium is 0.7% uranium-235, which is fissile, it's once to split, but it's 99.3% uranium-238, which is not fissile, okay? And so if you 
enrich it to a few percent, you can sustain a nuclear reaction if you slow the neutrons down. If you want to do this with fast neutrons, you've got to get up above 80% enrichment, which is what you have in the atomic bomb. <coughs> okay. uh, that is, an atomic bomb, uh, you want to have a runaway nuclear reaction that multiplies so fast <coughs> that it can happen before the thing has a chance to break apart and disassemble itself. So there you gotta use fast neutrons to make an atomic bomb. But for a reactor where you're using 3% rich fuel, 5% rich fuel, so you gotta slow the neutrons down. So what Rickover decided to do was for this slowing down process, which is known as moderating, okay, to use for a moderator water, which would also be the coolant in a reactor. And the key thing here is that if the reactor gets too hot, the water turns to steam and it becomes ineffective as a moderator. In other words, all of a sudden now your moderator has holes in it, okay? So the moderation becomes ineffective and that shuts down the reaction. Now, once you shut down the reaction, the water cools, the moderator is back in place, the reaction starts right back up, okay? Now, all this happens on <coughs> you know, a, a microsecond scale, this oscillation, okay? so. <coughs> What actually happens is the reaction sustains itself at just the level of moderate boiling in which the moderation has become just effective enough to sustain the reaction and no more. And so <clears throat> now if you increase the rate at which you're pumping water through the reactor, okay, then you can have uh, more reactions and still keep to the same low level of boiling, okay? So basically, you can control the amount of fission you have by how fast you run the water pump. What's not to like about that? And, and, and that is why, by the way, a, a water-moderated reactor cannot have a runaway fission reaction. It's physically impossible, okay? Because if it tries to run away, it boils the water too hard, the reactor Shuts down. The rate at which you run the pump controls the reactor. Okay. Um, and that is something in your control. So the book provides instructions on how to build your own nuclear reactor. So <laughs> this has some, it's got some good how-to sections. I also have a section on how to build your own fusion reactor. Um, <coughs> okay, so <coughs> nuclear reactor has um, nuclear power has come under attack by people who claim it's not safe. And they, um, yeah. That, yeah, man. I know what it's like to talk a lot. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Here are some of the most common claims. Uh, they emit cancer causing radiation. There is no way to dispose of the waste. They are prone to catastrophic accidents, and they could even be made to explode like bombs. These are all false. Okay, uh, the amount of radiation emitted by a nuclear reactor is trivial compared to the background radiation uh, that we have here on Earth. Um, the waste disposal is not a problem at all. Uh, the Navy disposes of its nuclear waste in salt caverns in New Mexico. The French dispose of nuclear waste in the facilities that they have. Um, the, the, what's happened is the anti-nukes have acted to block the establishment of disposal of civilian nuclear waste in order to create a problem for the commercial nuclear power industry, and they're quite open about this. So, you know, if the city of Los Angeles banned parking your car, there'd be no way to park your car. And people would say cars are impossible because they can't be parked. But that would be an artifact of uh, a regulation. It would not be uh, that it's technically impossible to park a car. Okay. Um, uh, they could have catastrophic accidents. Well, there have been over a thousand pressurized water reactors on land and sea for 60 years, that is since 1954, verse one. Uh, and not one person anywhere, actually that's 70 years, isn't it? Um, uh, has ever been harmed by a radiological release from a pressurized water reactor. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, now, in this context, I should address the accidents that there's three accidents that everybody knows about, which is Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and uh, Fukushima. Okay, let's talk about them. Three Mile Island was not a runaway chain reaction. It was what is known as a meltdown. Now, the possibility of a meltdown was widely understood, has always been widely understood. Here's what a meltdown is. If you have a nuclear reactor and you decide to shut it down, you can shut it down within milliseconds by dropping the control rods into it that have neutron absorbing material in them. Okay, boom, chain reaction shut off like that. However, there, if the reactor has been operating for any significant length of time, there's radiological waste products that are present within the fuel pellets, and they are gradually giving off heat. And so what happens is when you drop in the control rods, the reactor power level doesn't drop from 100% to zero, it drops instantly from 100% to 70%. And then over the course of hours, it will go down to 1% over the course of this day, and at the point 1%, but there's still residual power in there, and unless you're cooling it, it is enough to melt down. Now, the anti-nukes said, well, there you go. It can melt down, and what's to stop it? It will melt down through the steel pressure vessel that contains the, all the fuel and everything, and then it will hit the container building, which is eight feet thick reinforced concrete, and it will melt through that. And then it will melt down through the Earth's crust and to the Earth's core, and then for some reason it will keep going and come up the other side of the Earth in China. Okay, um, this is known as the China syndrome. Uh, well, at Three Mile Island, uh, there was a reactor anomaly which was misinterpreted by the uh, operators, and they shut the cooling system off, which was completely stupid. So they had a meltdown. Yeah, uh, and the fuel did melt, and it hit the steel pressure vessel and it melted its way about one inch into the eight inch thick steel pressure vessel and it stopped there, period. It didn't breach the pressure vessel, let alone the container building and certainly not China. Um, the, uh, and they, they did vent some radial iodine out of the system to cleanse it and this exposed the uh, population of nearby Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to the same radiation dose that they would have gotten had they spent the weekend in Colorado because at a higher altitude that we are in Colorado, the radiation levels are a bit higher. Um, the, um, <clears throat> so that was a, a, a non-event. The Three Mile Island is the only mega catastrophe in world history in which not a single person was hurt. Okay. Um, now, then there is uh, Fukushima. <clears throat> Fukushima, you had an earthquake and a tidal wave that destroyed the entire city, uh, killing 28,000 people from the tidal wave and the earthquake and falling buildings and drowning and, and this sort of stuff. Not a single person outside of the plant gate got a radiological dose of any significance. The three of the reactors were wrecked, but uh, there's a commercial loss, but nobody got a radiation dose as a result of this. So if anything, Fukushima shows the uh, safety of nuclear power plants. By the way, you should know the uh, pressure vessels, not the pressure vessels, the containment buildings that surround nuclear power plants. Um, we're built using a, a technology based on the stuff the Germans used to build U-boat pens in World War II. And the, the Germans had these the U-boat submarines on the coast of France, and they had to base them in places they knew the Allies would bomb them, and did, furiously. And we didn't breach those U-boat pens. Um, so they made the um, container buildings using the same technology and in fact, a requirement on these containment buildings, and this is since the 1960s, has been if they were hit by a commercial airliner, they wouldn't be breached. So in fact, if the 9-11 hijackers had decided to crash one of those planes into a nuclear power containment building, well, they would have smashed up the plane, but the plant would have just gone on doing business. Um, the, um, <clears throat> so there it is. Now, the Chernobyl, Plant, however, was in Russia, where they did not have containment buildings. There's no containment building in the Chernobyl plant. Furthermore, it wasn't a pressurized water reactor. 
it was a reactor moderated by graphite. Okay. Now, the thing about graphite is if you heat it up, it doesn't boil. So if you have a runaway, uh, if, you, if the reaction is escalating in power, there is no built-in strong negative feedback to shut it down. And in fact, I mean, if you design a graphite reactor correctly, you can create weak negative feedback, but in fact, the Chernobyl reactor had a, a positive feedback. And they were doing some goofy experiments, pulling the rods out, and they created a power excursion, and they did get a runaway chain reaction, okay, which broke the reactor apart. It was not an atomic bomb in that the total yield, of, that is the amount of uranium energy converted into heat, was like one-tenth of one percent instead of you know, like 80 percent, which you get in an atomic bomb, because it wasn't designed to have an, that fast chain reaction, but it was enough to break the reactor apart and blow the building open, because it was just an ordinary building, and now you have a graphite, red-hot graphite, exposed to the atmosphere, and that is flammable. So the Chernobyl reactor wasn't just unstable, it was actually flammable, and the graphite caught fire, and now you have a mechanism to take the uranium and all the radioactive waste products and shoot them into the atmosphere. Uh, and um, and so about 80 people were killed, mostly firefighters, brought in to try to suppress the fire. Um, but basically, th th those people were not victims of nuclear power, they were victims of the Soviet Union, okay? One of its smaller crimes. Um, but even so, okay. Um, now, the other criticism brought against nuclear power is that it's too expensive. And indeed, nuclear power, as it is in the United States today, is quite expensive. Um, why? It is because of hostile um, hyperregulation, which has caused the time to build a nuclear power plant to rise from three years in the 1950s to 16 years in the most recent nuclear power plant. And I've got data here um, which shows that the cost of a nuclear power plant in inflation adjusted dollars increases with the construction time squared. Now, you would think, well, it should probably increase linearly with construction time because basically cost is people times time. But what happens is the longer a project goes on, the more stuff gets accreted to it. And also you get this huge accretion of lawsuits, and lawsuits are much more, lawyers are much more expensive than you know, plumbers and construction workers. And uh, so this is what, what has happened. Um, and I have to tell you that this uh, regulatory uh, structure that has been imposed on nuclear power, people say, well, we need it, it makes it safer. No, it doesn't make it safer at all, okay? It impedes taking measures to improve safety or performance. And uh, in the 80s, I actually was, um, I worked for the Washington State Office of Radiation Protection. And we, we had some regulatory authority over nuclear power plants in Washington State and also in uh, Oregon. And the just across the river in Oregon, there was a very nice nuclear power plant called the Trojan plant, which was producing nuclear energy at two cents per kilowatt hour. Not just competitive with fossil fuels, this was competitive with cheap hydroelectric power in the Pacific Northwest. But they had a problem, which was that um, in the secondary loop, that is the primary loop is the water that goes through the reactor, the secondary loop is water that heat exchanges with that stuff and powers the turbine. Secondary loop was uh, rusting away, and they'd have to shut the reactor down every six months and replace the pump. And the utility looked at this and said, well, we know what the problem is here. We were too cheap. We put carbon steel pipes into the secondary loop. We want to replace it with stainless steel. They said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, says, no way. Your license specifies carbon steel for those pipes. If you want to replace those pipes with a different alloy, you need to get a new license. And by the 1980s, that was out of this. Okay. The, the, the process to get a new license would, would shut them down for years. Okay, so they said, no, we'll just keep using carbon steel. 
So taking an elementary measure, uh, step to improve the operation of the plant was forbidden. Okay? And this is also why people don't want to introduce new designs. Because it's hard enough to get a design approved that they've already approved 500 times, let alone coming in with something new. So it imposes stagnation. Okay? And it also <clears throat> imposes technological stagnation in other, for other reasons as well, which I'll get to. Uh, but you should know that it, today it takes four years to build a nuclear power plant in South Korea or in China. Okay. And uh, China is bigger than South Korea, so they're building more of them. Um, they intend to build 450 new nuclear power plants in China between now and the year 2050, and perhaps export another 400 to the developing world. Um, and by the way, the thing with the developing world right now, it's not about village power. As countries in Africa develop, the people move from the villages to the cities, and you've got cities growing just like happened here and in Europe, when you move from a rural country to a city country, okay? And so these power needs need to be met by large-scale sources. Uh, and the Chinese are, are, well, they basically copied a Russian design and they're now marketing it all over the world. Um, okay, now, <clears throat> I mentioned that natural uranium is 99.3% uranium-238, which is not desirable. However, and we enrich it to about 3% when you put it into a fission reactor. However, the, and the rest remains U-238. Now, when U-238 absorbs a neutron, it doesn't split, it just becomes plutonium-239. And that is desirable. And it turns out you can make more plutonium-239 then the uranium-235 will burn it. So you can actually breathe more fuel than you are burning. Okay. And, well, in, up to a point. That is, until all the uranium-238 is used up. But basically, you're getting 100 times as much energy out of a piece of uranium as you can in a normal reactor. This is known as a breeder reactor. And this has been known since the 1940s. And the first experimental breeder reactors operated in 1953. Um, and so why aren't we doing this? The reason is because the construction cost of nuclear power plants has been inflated so much that the cost of fuel is only 5% of the cost of the power. So number one, it wouldn't be that big a game to make fuel much cheaper. If you made the fuel free, you'd still be left with 95% of the present cost. But also, a new kind of reactor would be much harder to license. So those two things, if there isn't that much to gain by making the fuel cheaper, and it'd be much more expensive to introduce and try to license a new kind of reactor, those things have prevented us from going to breeder reactors. Okay. And there's two kinds of breeder reactors you can make. There's the one I just described where you breed a uranium into plutonium, and there's another kind where we breed thorium into uranium. And that can also work. And thorium is eight times as common as uranium. Um, all right. So, any serious R&D into more advanced fission reactors by the U.S. government stopped in the early 90s with the Clinton uh, Gore administration. Um, and so, uh, well, we were already using, as I said, over 90% rig over pressurized water reactors, and we still are. Now, there are people who say, well, this is clearly a problem. We're using the same kind of reactor that was introduced in the 1950s. That's got to be the problem with nuclear energy. Now, <clears throat> I disagree with that. Uh, I think the rig over reactors are fine to some um, and the problem with nuclear energy is the hospital hyperregulation. But that said, uh, it certainly can be improved on. Um, and there are efforts now by a group of entrepreneurial firms, um, some led or financed by famous people like Bill Gates and others that are less well known, uh, who are looking at a whole bunch of concepts 
for uh, nuclear power. I'll mention two of them. Uh, one of them is the so-called small modular reactors. Um, and these, your, your typical uh, city scale pressurized water reactor right now is like 1,000 megawatts. They say, no, we're going to make them 50 megawatts each. And you can put three of them together, you'll have a 150 megawatt system. You can put 10 of them together, you have a 500 megawatt system. Uh, and you can make them in the factory, mass produce them. You, they're small enough, you can move them by truck, put them in them, and the, basically the uh, building of the nuclear power plant becomes more of an assemble on site thing than an actual construction job. Um, you get uh, not quite mass production, but numbers production working for you. You have a lot more of the job being done in a factory than at the construction site. And you know, any typical operation, let's say a weld, that you do in a factory takes like eight times as long to do in a construction site. Um, so this is one idea. So they're just pressurized water reactors, but built in this modular way. So this is, uh, you might say, the conservative uh, end of the scale on uh, new kinds of nuclear power plants. Then if you take the more radical idea, the most radical, is the um, uh, liquid salt, liquid uh, fluoride salt thorium reactor. Now this reactor actually uses a liquid fissile fuel that breeds uranium into thorium, and it can't have a meltdown because it already has melted down. Um, and um, this is a, a very radical idea. It was actually invented uh, by a visionary named uh, Alvin Weinberg, who ran the Oak Ridge lab in the, from the 40s through the 60s. Uh, he really wanted to do this, um, but in the late 60s, the Atomic Energy Commission said, we can only have one kind of breeding reactor, we're going to be a radium breeder, so he was shut out. But now there are people that are bringing this back. Um, and um, so there's a whole raft of entrepreneurial fishing companies who are trying to introduce these things. And I, I like this trend very much, but I do have to say that unless this hostile regulatory structure that is there is displaced, it will stop these two. In other words, I, I don't think that rational arguments about the inherent safety of small modular reactors or liquid thorium reactors will convince these people. Okay, people who could not be convinced that stainless steel piping was safe won't be yeah. convinced that uh, um, you know liquid thorium reactors are safe. Um, okay, now. Up till now, I've been talking about fission. There's the other kind of nuclear energy, which is fusion, which is actually the power that lights the stars. Um, now, and that, that is turning uh, light elements into heavier elements. Um, this is something, uh, I worked in the fusion program in the 80s at Los Alamos. <clears throat> and um, during the period from the 60s through the 80s, there was actually pretty fast progress in the fusion area. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, a, a graph showing uh, the accomplishments of various experiments uh, in this period. Uh, and the parameter that's being measured is the triple product, which is the density times the temperature times the confinement time. And it's going up in these units from 10 to the 17th to 10 to the 21st. So it's a factor of 10,000. And if it had done another factor of five, it would have reached ignition. But what happened was, in the 80s, okay, up through the 80s, this progress is being driven by very spirited competition between the national fusion programs. That is, between the Americans, the Soviets, the Europeans, and the Japanese, were the four major players, each trying to outdo the other. And this drove aggressive progress. But the 80s, the bureaucrats running the various programs got together and they said, this is so stressful. Why don't we work together? So they collapsed all the world national fusion programs into one international program called the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER. Okay, this happened around 1985. And so that no new machines, bigger machines, 
were built in any of these countries. Uh, and everybody started working on either, except they started working on either at the pace of an international program. It took them 30 years to decide where to put it. And it still hasn't been completed, okay? So basically, taking the competitive drive out of the effort um, brought progress to a screeching halt. However, as a result, actually, of the success of SpaceX, entrepreneurial money is going into fusion now. It's not going to Elon Musk. He's not involved in fusion at all. Okay, he's not a fusion guy. He's into solar energy. But the example of SpaceX said to investors, look, maybe the problem with fusion is the same as the problem of reusable space launch, which is that it wasn't fundamentally a technical problem, it was fundamentally an institutional problem. And it's the wrong kind of people that are doing it. And so you have a whole bunch of fusion startups uh, being funded in the United States and in um, the uh, British Commonwealth countries, uh, UK, Canada, and Australia. Um, that are being very aggressively funded, and to the tune of hundreds of millions and, and recently a, a billion dollars with the Commonwealth Fusion in Massachusetts. Uh, and they, these are exploring more advanced guard concepts, and they are working in a completely different mental universe in terms of schedule. Uh, and I think that one of these uh, companies will achieve uh, a fusion ignition this decade. They will achieve fusion ignition before either is even turned on. That's awesome. Okay. Um, and that, by the way, the big crowd over there that is trying out the energy, which is right here in California. Um, this is a tokamak energy in the UK. They're working on a concept called the spherical tokamak, which is dear to me. That's the one I was actually working on in Los Alamos in 1985. Um, and it was too avant-garde for either, but they're doing it. Um, now, space, okay. Um, well, most of the universe is dark, okay? There's no solar energy in between the stars, which is where most of the universe is, okay? And even in our own solar system, uh, solar energy is really only pretty good out to Earth's orbit and you get beyond. And even on the moon, where solar energy can be pretty strong, if you're on a planet that rotates, so you only have it half the time. Um, and on Mars, it's only 40% as strong as it is on Earth, and there's dust storms that can interrupt it for weeks. Uh, and then you get out you know, to Jupiter, and it's 4% as strong as on Earth. Saturn, it's 1% as strong. Uh, there's all sorts of resources, or excuse me, all sorts of materials out on other planets, such as Mars, my favorite, uh, that can be turned into resources, okay? But you need energy to do that. So basically, you need nuclear energy. Because on Mars, okay, solar energy is weak, wind energy is very weak, there are no fossil fuels, you won't have hydroelectric power until after the planet is terraformed, um, but nuclear power will work. And also, here's another thing, or two other things. First of all, in terms of fission, you're going to want to have breeder reactors on Mars. Because if you're bringing the fuel from Earth, then it does matter to get 99% or 90% of the energy out of it, not 1%. And if you're mining it on Mars, on Mars, for a very long time, there won't be a global transportation network. Here on Earth, you see, if you want to get Uranium fuel, you can get it from some place in the Congo or somewhere where there's, you know, uranium ore, 10% of, of the rock. Here on Mars, you're going to have to get your uranium from rocks that are within, you know, 30 kilometers of your base or city or something. And so you probably won't have access to high quality ore. So whatever it is, you're going to want to get the full value of the energy out of the uranium, not one percent. That's a luxury before on Earth and on Mars. So the Martians are going to be driven to develop more advanced fission reactors, and they're going to be especially driven to develop fusion reactors. Because you know what? Deuterium, which is the actual isotope of hydrogen used in fusion reactors, 
is five times as common on Mars as it is on Earth. Okay. So there you have it. And uh, a Mars city will be electrolyzing a great deal of water every day as part of its life support system, which means separating out the gaseous hydrogen from the water, which is what you need if you want to now do isotope separation and get the deuterium. Uh, so the Martians are going to have a lot of deuterium on their hands, and they'll be able to use it for power, but also fusion rockets. And, you know, steam engines didn't really become efficient until we put them into steam boats. Okay. And of course, nuclear power didn't become practical until we put them in submarines. I think fusion power is going to become perfected when it's used in fusion reactor, uh, fusion rockets. Okay. And a fusion rocket will not only enable fast interplanetary travel, in principle, a fusion rocket can get an exhaust velocity of 7% of the speed of light. Wow. Yeah, which is an entry capability for interstellar travel. So, back to global warming. Okay, okay global warming is real. Um, that statement is controversial because the warmists, as the people who are calling attention to this phenomenon, um, have not been willing to present the most convincing evidence. And the most convincing evidence is not claims that they have thermometers all over the world and they've measured that the world's temperature has risen one degree C since 1870, because that gets challenged on all sorts of statistical grounds and so forth. Where's your thermometers if you put them in the right place? Um, but they're simple things. For instance, the length of the growing season in the United States. And you can see it's actually grown very substantially since 18 million. Okay? Now, the warmists don't present this data to people, which conclusively proves global warming. Uh, why? Because it's a positive trend. Okay? And there's other things that are positive about this. Uh, CO2 enrichment to the atmosphere. Well, that's easy to measure. By the way, the warming of one degree is, you know, 0.3% of the temperature of the Earth has increased. That is. Okay. But the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased from 280 parts per million to 420. That's an increase of 50%. That is significant. That's much more significant than the temperature rise. Okay, which is why all these people that want to put sulfide gases in the Earth's atmosphere to cool the planet are completely missing the point. The real problem here is not the temperature increase, which is modest. The real problem is the change in atmospheric chemistry. Okay. Uh, now, that has had beneficial effects so far on land because uh, a limited ingredient for plant growth on land is CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, but in the ocean, not so, okay? There's been no increase in the productivity of the ocean. What's been increasing is the CO2 levels in the ocean, okay? And there's evidence that this could threaten um, marine life. Um, uh, corals and phytoplankton and such, it's acidifying the ocean. And the reason for this, you see, what's the difference between a, a pollutant and a resource? The difference is the resource is something you're using. A pollutant is something that is spreading out all, all over the place and you're not using it. Water can be a pollutant if you have it spreading all over the land and turning your land into a swamp. Used correctly, it's a tremendous resource for improving your agriculture. Okay. The uh, CO2 is the same way. CO2 is as necessary for plant growth as water is. Okay. But if it's flooding the joint and you're not utilizing it, it's harming you. Now, the thing is this, in the ocean, the limiting material for plant growth is not CO2. It's trace elements like iron and nitrates and things like this. And that is why 90% of the fundamental productivity of the ocean occurs within 10% of the ocean, which is, say, the continental shelves, river estuaries, and a few uh, particular upwelling areas like the Grand Banks. Um, and the reason why the upwelling areas are productive is because, you see, if you go deep in the ocean, below where the sunlight is, there's no photosynthetic organisms there. 
to scavenge the trace elements. So those layers, the deep layer of the ocean, remains rich in the trace elements necessary for phytoplankton growth. But if they stay down there, they don't do any good. In the Grand Banks, through a natural process, they're brought to the surface, and the place is enriched, and you've got phytoplankton growth, and then zooplankton, and then fish, and all that. Okay. With nuclear power, we can do the following. Number one, we can replace a substantial amount of the CO2 emission uh, power generation itself. Okay? That's important. Very important. Number two, we could put platforms out in the ocean and pump deep water to the surface. We could make the oceans fertile. 90% of the ocean, 60% of the Earth's surface is essentially a desert. It doesn't produce any water. We can make it fertile. And of course, with nuclear power on land, we can desalinate seawater and make the deserts of the Earth on land fertile. Okay. And this is how we stop global warming. We don't stop global warming by making fuel too expensive for poor people to afford. We stop global warming by replacing fossil fuels with something that is actually much more abundant than fossil fuels and which has no carbon emissions. Fossil fuels themselves were a big improvement on horse-drawn vehicles, okay? Uh, much less polluting than horse-drawn vehicles. Um, the, 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 so we didn't clean up the cities by making horses too expensive, okay? We cleaned up the cities by introducing something superior. And we can do the same with fossil fuels. All right, so I mentioned the hostile hydro regulation. Okay. Here is um, a flow chart of the NRC's simple 32 step process in giving approval for nuclear power. Okay. And actually, it's much more complicated than this because each of these 32 steps within it has another flow chart. Okay, and then another flow chart. So if you actually expand this, it looks like the map of the New York subway system. If you've ever seen the map of the New York subway system, it's a sight to see. Uh, and it's really crazy. Um, and so, for instance, one of these boxes is approval by the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, now the Environmental Protection Agency will not only demand an environmental impact statement that they will take years to examine, but they will ask the utility to justify questions like the following. Why did you decide to build a nuclear power plant instead of a different kind of power plant? Okay. And you have to understand, imagine that you own some land out in the country and you decide you're gonna put a wide cap on it. Okay, fine. So, all right, a reasonable process might be to go to the town government to present your plans for the log cabin and have them approved by the authorities. So this, they don't want some piece of junk built, okay? Bring down the values of the houses. Fine. But what if they don't just ask you to approve, to have an approved plan for building your house? They ask you to prove to the authorities that it was the right decision to build a log cabin in there instead of a chalet, a Cape Cod, um, you know, this other kind of house, a gas station, a nuclear missile silo, a zoo, okay? The, the, you know, uh, prove to us that this was the right decision, okay? And let's say somehow you do get the mayor to agree that you actually did make the right choice. But now there's a process in place where anyone can challenge that decision and bring it to court. Okay, and now you have to prove to the court that the decision that you made and the mayor was convinced was correct was actually correct. That, in fact, the log cabin was the correct building to put there and not a chalet, okay, or a Cape Cod. And you manage to convince the judge and the jury of that. But then the other side appeals and it goes to the next court. This is the process for getting the approval of a nuclear power plant in the United States today. This is why it takes 16 years instead of three. Um, it's a madhouse. And um, 
and, and, and as I say, it, it, it does not contribute to safety. It, it contributes to stagnation. Um, nobody wants to do anything new when it's hard enough to get approval on things that are well established. Uh, and uh, now I think the whole process is wrong. Um, I think that, um, well, actually what I think is that the way environmental enforcement should be done overall is the law should be that you don't pollute, and if you do, you get prosecuted, but you don't get prosecuted until you do. Um, it's like if you want to take a car trip, you get in your car and you drive. If you speed, a cop pulls you over and gives you a ticket. You do not have to go to the police station before the trip and convince the police that you're not going to speed. Okay. The um, and the the and, and, and so that is what is required, and, and that frankly is required not just for nuclear power, but to uh, you know back in two thousand and nine, uh, Obama got his stimulus bill passed, a trillion dollars. He said we're going to build rapid transit, all this stuff. Okay, none of it got built. Okay, because even though they wanted to do it. The administration wanted to do it. They got tied up in all the red tape of themselves. Uh, so to build anything, whether it's mass transit or, or, or housing or, or what have you, this system has to be uh, corrected. And finally, there's another issue. Okay. If I had asked anyone, say, four years ago, 2019, back in the days before COVID, before the world fell apart. Um, what's the major threat to humanity? Uh, most people would have said global warming. That was on the top of the list. Uh, a few people might have said resource depletion and even a few population explosion. But the global warming would have been at the top. Now, well, yeah, there's still some people that say global warming, but uh, war has moved into the competitive range. Okay. Um, and, but what is war? War, and, and, and that's what I would say, uh, war is a product of bad ideas. And in particular, in other words, the, the major thing, I, I believe humanity is under threat right now of a catastrophe. But it's not a catastrophe caused by climate change, even though climate change is real. Um, it's a catastrophe caused by the same things that caused the catastrophes in the 20th century. Okay, the catastrophes of the 20th century, the world wars, the Holocaust, the Holodomor, they were not caused by climate change. Okay, they were caused by bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea which came in a variety of forms. And what that bad idea was, was, there isn't enough for everyone. Okay, so we need to fight it out with them to see who will get what is there. Okay, that 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 is it. And you know, 1914, or actually 1912, uh, General Friedrich von Bernhardi, the chief intellectual of German general staff, writes his bestseller Germany in the Next War, in which he says. Look, here's Eurasia. Who's going to get it? Us Germans or the Russians? Okay? One of the two. Uh, who's it going to be? Uh, us or them? So we're going to have to fight it out with them. Should we fight it out sooner or later? Well, clearly sooner because we can take them down now before they industrialize. Okay? So two years later, they used the pretext of assassination of the Archduke to launch World War I. And Europe, which was the most prosperous it had ever been in history, tears itself to pieces. 1939, Hitler, even more hysterically, Germany needs living space. The laws of existence require uninterrupted killings so that the better men live. This, this was pure nonsense, okay? Pure nonsense. Uh, the, the, the Germany did not need more space. Germany today is smaller than the Third Reich, and it has a larger population, but a much higher standard of living. Why? Not because they succeeded in invading other countries, killing the people, and stealing their cows. Okay. They did do some of that, but that did not raise their living standards. 
And had they won the war, it would not have improved their living standards at all to implement that program in full. Okay. Their living standards were raised by the global advance of science and technology, which was a global human project to which Germans certainly have contributed, but so have people of many other nations and races, including notably people they were trying to exterminate. And had they been successful, they would be much poorer, and so would everyone else. They use, once again, inventions made anywhere get used everywhere, sooner or later. Okay. The, uh, but this is the thing. Now, I happen to know, and some people here may also know, that there are people in the American national security establishment who believe that war with China is inevitable. Why? Because there's 1.4 billion of them, and if they all start driving cars all over the place like we do, or even like Europeans do, there won't be enough oil in the world. So we gotta knock them down. And you can bet your bottom dollar that there are people in Beijing who think exactly like them, but are sitting on the opposite side of the chessboard and have similar plans, okay? And if this is the kind of thinking that is allowed to go forward, there will be war. Okay. And we will kill each other, despite the fact that humans overall are living today much better than they ever had before in human history. But the same is true in Europe in 1914. So we've got to make it clear that resources are infinite. Now, here's another one for you. Hitler, we'll quote him again. He said this idea of perpetual prosperity and plenty through science, he said, this is a Jewish plot to undermine the people's belief in the necessity for a war. Now, it's not a Jewish plot. But it does undermine people's belief in the necessity for war. Now, he's tired. He wants people to believe in the necessity for war because the putative necessity for war is the principal foundation for tyranny. So we must undermine people's belief in the necessity for by undermining people's belief in the necessity for war, we undermine tyranny and we undermine war. And that's the case for news. So here, here, here's the fundamental question. Okay. See, look, if the idea is accepted that the world's resources are fixed with only so much to go around, then each new life is unwelcome. Each unregulated act or thought is a menace. Every person is fundamentally the enemy of every other person and every race of every race. And the ultimate outcome can only be enforced stagnation, tyranny, war, and genocide. Only in a world of unlimited resources can all men be brothers. On the other hand, if it is understood that the unfettered creativity can open unbounded resources, then each new life is a gift. Every race or nation is fundamentally the friend of every other race or nation. And the central purpose of government must be not to restrict human freedom, but to defend it at all costs. And that's why we must unleash the nuclear energy revolution. For in doing so, we make the most forceful statement possible that we are living not at the end of history, but at the beginning of history that we believe in freedom and not regimentation, in progress and not stasis, in love rather than hate, in peace rather than war, and then rather than death, and in life rather than death, and in hope rather than in despair. And yeah, that's the case for this. Thanks. We do have time for questions, and I ask if you want to ask a question, please come forward to the microphone. I wish we had a wireless microphone, but please come forward and ask away. Yeah. And I got Dr. Rubin, this is, you know me, Sean Boyke. Um, you were bringing up the TAE, the fission in, uh, what is it, Lake Forest, Mission Viejo. I, I visited them, and I seen them, they, they thought they could do it in eight years. I think they could do it in seven, but I think you're right about that. And I think that's fantastic. And I'm really interested in interstellar travel.
rifle also and your propulsion system. So, boy, we have a lot to talk about. Um, now, do you see that, would that replace the, the thorium type of nuclear power plants that you're looking at as being one of the better ones right now? Would that like be the ultimate? To beat that one that's, you know, the... Well, it, it's not the ultimate. There, there are things you can do that go beyond what TAE is doing. But the thorium reactor is more near term. Okay, yeah, sure. functioning thorium, rig over. Jimmy Carter had rig over turn the shipping port reactor into a thorium reactor oh. um, in the 1970s as oh. a demonstration. So the thorium reactor is much closer to, to realization. It's just that no one has the guts to do it in the current regulatory environment. Okay. Yes. Uh, now, a fusion reactor of the type being pushed by, say, TAE, uh, would certainly be a, a more advanced thing than a thorium reactor. Okay, but it, it's some years out. Uh, it, it, it's still a number of years from uh, experimental demonstration, let alone commercialization. Now, beyond the TAE type of reactor, there's other things that could use um, as fuel proton and boron reactor. Uh, that's harder to do. But in other words, I don't think there is an ultimate energy source. Because I, I got to tell you something. I don't think we know all the laws of the universe. That's true. OK, uh, we really don't. Um, there, you know, if you read a physics textbook, it will tell you that matter energy cannot be converted or destroyed. And as engineers, we work with that. Okay, I have always worked with that. That's a good working hypothesis. But it is not true. Clearly, matter energy can be created because it was. <laughs> There's some. Where did it come from? The, 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 it's all around us. Okay, that is the, the, the laws of physics that we work with are clearly not the ultimate laws of physics. Um, and the, the, so the, just like those scientists who couldn't explain how the sun could possibly be here and be 100 million years old, we're living in a universe whose existence we cannot explain, okay? And when you discover new laws of the universe, you discover vast new worlds of technology that could become possible. Right. So we here, we engineers, we can talk about the next step and we can kind of see the one after that, proton, boron, fusion, but there's going to be something after that, and something after that. Fantastic. One other question, and you brought it up and I was, I'm really impressed. All the trace elements that are in the ocean, of course, the oceans, all the seas are more than 70% of the earth, right? So, and they got all the trace elements. We could bring those up and use them. Man, okay. Can you expand just a little bit on that? Because that is probably the best way to improve our Earth in a better way than I've ever seen before or thought of before. And I think my buddy, Dr. Paul Werbos, would agree with you. Okay. Well, it's uh, natural upwelling of the ocean brings nutrients from the deep to the surface where there is also sunlight. You have to have the elements, you gotta have the energy in the same place, okay? And the uh, so in the few places in the earth where you do have na natural upwelling, you have tremendous biological productivity. Uh, what we can do with nuclear power is create artificial upwelling and bring the fertile waters from the deep up to the surface where sunlight can act on it and you create phytoplankton and you create fisheries where there are none. Spectacular. Yeah. And maybe even some islands that don't exist. Well, you could also create islands, um, but uh, for a larger population. Yeah. But well, the first thing I would do is irrigate Australia. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a whole continent there, and right. many other places actually. Um, I think only about 20 percent of the Earth's land is farmed, uh, and anyway, one more. But clearly, desalination is, is something way to happen. Absolutely. So, Thank you. Uh, you talked about the problems of um, maybe hyper-regulation and uh, the implication, a lot of that was obviously referring to the United States and I think you made a comparison um, with Korea versus uh, versus here, for example, uh, compared to the US. 
uh, in terms of how long it takes to get a, you know, to build a nuclear reactor and to get it uh, approved. Um, are they doing anything in terms of sort of the the newer designs or technologies that you could use? And you talk about <coughs> some private companies here in the U.S. that are doing that in places like Korea that seem like maybe they have a, a sort of more enlightened regulatory structure. Are they doing anything interesting in terms of the underlying technology, or is there more just in terms of just implementation of what's already there, but just without the crazy regulation? Well, as far as I know, in South Korea, it's mostly just ready with the existing designs. Um, although South Korea is starting to become a serious player in fusion. Okay. Um, the, because they are not uh, as tied into either as, as the others are. Um, the Chinese are um, introducing, uh, well, it's not entrepreneurial, it's the government, but uh, uh, breeder reactors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? You've talked a lot about um, how great nuclear power plants are, and I agree with you. Um, the science is there, there have been failures, um, you've spoken on those. How can you help give us the tools to help reduce the anxiety and fear to the folks that might otherwise be a little too timid? You can get my book. <laughs> <laughs> All the tools I are. I think it's a volume discount. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, the book has all the arguments that you need to uh, explain to people uh, the truth about this. And, and you know, look, um, I spent most of my career in aerospace, but actually my doctorate is in nuclear engineering. And I'd have to say that when I introduced you. Okay. And in this book, I. Um, actually teach uh, many of the fundamental concepts of nuclear engineering. I do it mostly in the historical section in which I explain what happened and how the discoveries were made as it went forward. Uh, but uh, in other words, I want people to understand, not just be able to assert a nuclear power plant cannot explode like a bomb, but know why it cannot explode like a bomb, okay? Uh, that is, know from the point of view of the actual engineering principles. And so I, I, I discuss that nuclear waste disposal, other things, um, all those sorts of issues that people bring up, I, 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 I go through in the book. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Oh, come on. Did you want to? about the difficulties of uh, developing a nuclear reactor, reactor are quite impressive because uh, it's just a nightmare and of course our uh, foreign friends are doing a much better job of it than we are. Are there specific groups or organizations that we can go to and add our voices to to try to get a more sensible set of people to uh, populate the NRC and get things uh, well, th there are, uh, and actually in the book, in the uh, second to last chapter, where I talk about the politics, I name a few, uh, and the, these organizations, um, there are some that have uh, um, right-wing tribal affiliations, and some that have left-wing tribal affiliations. So depending upon your tribe, you can find the right congregation to hang out with. Um, the, and, and actually there, there's a point there, which is that um, until fairly recently, most of the pro-nuclear organizations were only to be found in the right or half of the political spectrum. Now, actually, until 1970, there were plenty of left-wing pro-nukes, okay? The, the, Nuclear power was actually the product of the Roosevelt and Truman administrations and was strongly supported by Kennedy and Johnson. The, the Democrats turned against nuclear energy in the 70s. Uh, the, and in fact, if you want to know, the, the, the nuclear rocket program, one of its last defenders 
was Alan Cranston, who was the uh, liberal Democrat senator from California, strong defender of the Nirva role for uh, nuclear rocket launcher. Um, but that group passed from the scene, and the Democrats became strongly anti-nuclear until quite recently. And now there's an organization called the Third Way, which um, uh, Cory Booker is a member of it. Uh, uh, John Kerry, actually, uh, last week made a statement that we cannot possibly reach net zero without nuclear power. Okay. Now, the issue is there uh, that while they are starting to make pro-nuclear statements, uh, they haven't really got in and mixed it up with the anti-nukes who remain in the Democratic Party and who, for example, have blocked the establishment of a nuclear waste repository in Nevada. Uh, in other words, it's one thing to say nuclear power got to have it, and it's another thing to get the people who are going to it out of the way. Then it becomes a context. But yes, there, there's a list of organizations in here that you could sign up with, uh, whichever you find most convenient. Are most of the slides in your book? Yes. Ken has a question. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, Kyle Monsey on behalf of the students here. So uh, Dr. Zubin has been previously very well known for the Mars you know, settlement exploration. And uh, what prompted you to kind of shift to the uh, focus on the nukes? But the ideology seems to be same, seems to be linked. And could you t explain to our students here and how would they um, you know, from the young generation, how to think about the world and what they should do, uh, think ahead for their future to help uh, the human future like all the same. Well, Ken, you hit it on the head. The ideology, if you will, is the same. Okay? The ideology, I don't like the word ideology, but the, the world view is the same. The thrust is the same. The thrust is to deny the proposition that there isn't enough for everyone, okay? And nuclear energy refutes that in one way, opening the space frontier does it in another way, okay? In certain ways, opening the space frontier does it in the most visible way because, well, I can put it. Um, look, if you went up to a person who doesn't understand mathematics, and you claim to that person that one inch long line segment has an infinite number of points in it, they would find that argument to be fantastical. How is it possible that a one inch long line segment can have an infinite number of points in it? That is ridiculous, right? Okay, that's like claiming that the Earth has infinite resources, which it does, for the same reason that a one inch long line segment has an infinite number of points in it, okay? look at it, as it were, intensively in terms of what we can invent, whether it's nuclear power, fusion power, proton boron power, the, the, the new laws of physics power, okay, biotechnology, which is nanotechnology made real, okay, programmable, self-reproducing microorganisms that can be programmed to make any chemical you want or something. They, 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 okay, you have to, But anyone can be made to understand that a line that goes infinitely in both directions can clearly have an infinite number of points in it, right? That's actually easier to see than that the line segment can have an infinite number of points in it. So nuclear power is proving that the line segment has an infinite number of points in it. Opening the space frontier is proving that the line goes on infinitely. Um, they're both the same thing. But you see, it is the fundamental question, okay? If the resources are finite, then fundamentally all people are enemies. And the only friends you have, it's like in, in what the, 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 the Hunger Games, right? Where the, 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 a couple of kids can be allies for a little while to kill some other kids, but fundamentally they're all enemies, right? The um, Okay, but, the, 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 but if it's the case that resources are things that are created by people, 
then fundamentally we're all threats. Fundamentally, the existence of every other person is a benefit to you because they can create something that you can benefit from. Okay, that's the fundamental issue here. And and, and, and that's the, the the contest that that, that that's the battle of ideas that is going on in the world today. And the tyrants, the warmongers, they want people to believe there's only so much to go around, so we must fight, and therefore they are necessary. <coughs> okay? And we have to undermine them. We can undermine them in print, or we can undermine them by what we do in the lab, or on the launch pad. Um, but we gotta undermine them. speaker again. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Do me the raven, right? Yeah. I want a trophy for that. Where is this for? That's right. Okay, well, we fell off you. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Well, okay. okay. All right. All right. Cool. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob.
media recruits people and they come up with their own ideas on how to get the truth. And for one person, it's creating a rocket company, for the other, it's creating a blockbuster film. Uh, they, they, there's different things and different kinds of people can be. Yeah, it's good. Okay, yeah. it's good. Oh, thanks.